Yeah, my name's Richard Tommy Campion. Everyone calls me Tommy. No one else knows me as Richard except myself. I, at the moment, I'm 68 and I live on the Gold Coast. And where'd you grow up? I grew up in Lismore in New South Wales in a, in a home actually. I've spent uh, 14 years living in a children's home. No mum and dad, dumped off, put there, and that's what happened. And when did you move to the coast? I moved to the coast probably about uh, 30 years, 35 years ago. And many times I was going to leave, but I couldn't. I used to tell my daughter, one day your father will have to go. And that was when she was 16. I still didn't go. I couldn't go, with, I could not leave her. When she was 18, I said, no, one day your father's got to leave here to better his life. I stayed. When she turned 21, I said, well, I'll, your father's going to go one day, but he's still here. And when I left the children's home, they, they gave me a job working in a hardware store. But I knew I could do something better than that. I didn't want to sell nails and paint. And I saw an ad in the Northern Star, which is a newspaper in Lismore. And it said, wanted cadet photographer, must be outgoing. And I thought, well, I'm outgoing, or I could be by just pretending to be outgoing. So I applied for the job. I was full of pimples. I was frightened. I had long socks and short pants. And I had an interview and they liked me and I actually showed some photographs to them, which actually weren't mine. I'd borrowed them off a mate of mine. And then I got back for a second interview and they still liked me. And then um, I went back for a third interview and, and they said I had the job. Now I often wondered, did they give me that job because I was a poor child from a, an orphanage? But I found out later, no, they did like my ability. So um, I stayed at the Northern Star for uh, probably four or five years, done my cadetship, mixed chemicals, done everything possible. So um, tell us about the, the first camera that you used when you started work, John. Well, I feel that, that firstly, that leaving, um, I knew I could do better than the Northern Star, so I actually applied for a job at the Courier Mail. And when I arrived the first time, they gave me a Nikon, um, it was a Nikomat and a couple of lenses I'd never used before and within about three or four hours of being there I was sent out in a job and um, I had to cover some people who were swimming and I, I'd never used a wide angle lens before actually back in those days and it was a frightening situation to see someone drive, diving off the blocks into the camera and I thought wow this is going to be great but it, but it had been done so many times before but they loved it so much I used it on the front page. So that was the nick on the first time I've used them and I've used them ever since. Still using them. Okay, so just run through a quick timeline of your employment, so the different jobs you, you did. So in the 60s I was at the um, Northern Star and my ambition at that time was to work for um, the uh, Queensland newspapers, which was the Courier Mail, because of broadsheet. I used to like those huge photographs and it was probably in the 70s, but I ended up going to Townsville and working for a paper up there for a while, wondering what was going to come in my life, what was I doing up there? And finally I was offered a job, you know, in the uh, late 70s at the Courier Mail. So I hastily went to that and I started from there and after a couple of years, I imagine, I thought it was the most boring paper I'd ever been to in my life and I'd only been to a few. And I was asked, I had an interview for the Australian in a pub and we had a few beers and we actually spoke about the Australian and about myself and then they said, we'll let you know. So a few days later, I gave notice at the Courier Mail and um, a month later I'm at the, at the Australian and loved it. And off I went. It was just wonderful, trips away, beautiful people. Lots of time to think and lots of time to, to, um, to, to stay on a job. It was very exciting. Okay, so um, after the Australian, I, I got sick and tired of the newspaper industry, so I left. But I actually came back and I started working for the Sunday Sun, which was a huge paper. It used to be called the Sunday Truth. And that was huge. And I loved that so much. But I still thought it was a pain in the ass. I didn't like the way things were running. So I left again and went and picked beans. And then I came back again and started 
and then I left again and then they started up a bureau, a news limited bureau on the Gold Coast and they asked me would I like to sort of go there and work, not to be the boss but just to be a bit of work and, and I decided that would be the greatest thing so they built the office and I built the dark room. So um, Gold Coast became one of the the great cities of Australia, you know, with the beaches, there was a lot of crime, there was a lot of stories, there were a lot of deaths, there was a lot of things happening, so it was a sort of a full-time job and, and you know, you really cut your teeth there. You you had to be available 24 hours a day. And I was. Most of the time I was drunk when I went out in jobs, but that's part of the business, isn't it? So. Um, I sort of stayed there until the paper closed down about five years later. So I was out of work then and um, then I started doing casual work for the Courier Mail back there again, filling in for people when they went on holidays and et cetera, et cetera, and um, basically just freelanced and just had a great time. So I hadn't done much. I'd been around, I had it was a chequered career, but as far as covering sort of huge events all around the world. No, no, I didn't do all that, but I managed to score a lot of good jobs that you could get your teeth into. So um, basically, um, I just stayed around and enjoyed. i done a lot of stuff for the Telegraph. i done a lot of stuff for Page Three Girls for the Mirror, um, all that sort of stuff, a lot of models, a lot of nudes. Uh, test shots for Penthouse and Playboy and all that stuff, you know, whatever, chase fire brigades and ambulance and police cars. Two, two three, four, whatever, of the um, the big stories that stand out when you look back now on your career that you covered. Yeah, some of the big stories of my career, um, probably not really exciting, but, you know, there was one in particular, I imagine, I was at SeaWorld once and just trying to set up some sort of a photograph and someone said, quick, Tommy, you better get over to the pond here. There's a dolphin being born in captivity. There's probably a very rare situation anywhere. I said, yeah, I'll just finish this up be over there. But I went over there and I could not believe this dolphin tearing around the pool and had a half a little dolphin coming out of it. It's like a little torpedo. The head was in, the tail was out. So because I... I was very excited about this. This was it. This was the big one. Where do you photograph it though? It goes it was under the water next to me to go over there and it'll be up here, then it'll be up there and you didn't know where it was going to come out. And the bloke sort of guided me. He said, where that ripple is, righto, now hit it. And up she goes. And I thought, wow, I've got this little dolphin. And I kept on following and I got used to it. I ended up taking about oh, 10 or 12 frames and the baby was actually born under the water, even though I had those other ones of it leaping in the air, was trying to push it out. And, you know, that, that split second that baby was born, it come up out of the water and started swimming next to the mother. And they just kept on going around and around in a circle. The whole situation, back in those days, you know, you take, you take your film out, right? You used to wind your film on, you take it out, and I just had a habit of always keeping that in my hand. It always stayed there for some reason while I had this other one. I don't know why I didn't put it in my pocket. But on that particular day, it dropped into the water, this roll of film that I'd taken of these, this baby being born. It dropped into the water and another dolphin came up and started bloody playing with it. And I thought, I'm just going to eat it. You know, I was going to die and there me pictures. But the diver got it out and they put it in a bucket of water and I took it back to work. And I processed it up and down the tank and in the tank there and it was perfect. No worries whatsoever. So those pictures sort of went around the world and everyone loved them and I was very excited about the whole sort of situation. And so that was good. Um, there was another situation where there was a young child kidnapped. Uh, a young girl was kidnapped on the Gold Coast and of course it was a manhunt looking for the kidnappers. There were three blokes involved. They asked for a million dollar uh, ransom, which was later lowered to 500,000 into 250,000. However, 
the chase were on. There, there's choppers in the sky, any media from most areas in Brisbane and beyond Brisbane and anywhere, any blokes from Sydney come up to the Gold Coast. So our office at the Sun used to be um, Murdoch's office and it used to be sort of in the middle of service paradise. So we sat there with the police radio and we heard a call to say there's been a sighting. So by the time we got the car started, you'd see half a dozen police cars go past and we couldn't get out in the road. There was a fire brigade going past and then all these media's going past and there's sirens going, people are waving their arms and I thought, oh, we are doomed. We're never, never going to get out. We're going to miss it. So off we went, heading down the road there. It's very exciting. The heart is thumping. And the journalist, Scott McKenzie, with me, said, oh, look, there's the dog squad. We'll follow it. I said, no, no, don't follow the dog squad. He said, I'm following the dog squad. So off he goes around the corner. And just as we got around the corner, just up on the beach front, the car comes to halt, cuts off a car, I jumps out of the car. I was probably here about 10 feet away. I grabbed the camera and put it up and I started shaking and I was holding my breath and I started knocking off these shots of the black head. The gun pointed at the kidnapper. Put your hands up, get down on the ground, don't make a move, I'll shoot. And I'm shooting and I'm thinking, uh, I hope he knows that I'm over here, I'm just, you know, and, and which he did, because I found out later that he had an idea. So they they grabbed this bloke and they took him round the side of the car and they put a gun at his head and they sort of half stripped him off. But we were the only newspaper there. No TV, no one, but when they actually had him on, picked him up from the ground, all, everyone else turned up. So we got a real scoop there. That was quite amazing to, to have that. Um, it was... You know, it was pretty heartbreaking to see what happened. And, but having those photographs is just an amazing feeling that you process them and then you go and buy a big carton of beer and you celebrate. Beautiful. Just from my experience, I always found that you, on a news job, you, you have to sort of be good at reading the story to sort of you know, be prepared to be in the right spot or work out what's going to happen next. I want to just talk about that a little bit? Yeah, just to go on a news job, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you've got to know the storyline. You want to know what's happening. Usually they have a bit of a brief on the way there, but mostly the journalist does, does not know anyway. You've got a piece of paper with a few facts written out there. But basically that's... Um, you, you soon pick up on those sort of things, you know, that this bloke has just put out a hit record or he's just growing a large cabbage. So you sort of know. I think it's pretty basic, but sometimes you just can't get the grasp of it. So you tend to miss out on that special photograph, you know. Um, it is a tricky question, that one. But um, basically, you, you know, when you've been in newspapers for a long time and you know what's going on, basically you, you get advice from the journalists if you listen and you'll have to push a bit sometimes to get that picture you want to get them to do something different. But basically, uh, no, nah, it's all simple, all too easy. Um, tell, give us a couple of um, funny stories of things that happened to you on jobs over the years. I'm sure you've got hundreds of them, but pick out uh, the, the favourites. Um, I, don't know if sort of, yeah. I suppose one of the one of the best, one of the funniest ones. I mean, there's there's dozens and dozens, but we'll, if I tell you them all, you'll all go to sleep. To sit, hang on, I'm speaking of sleep. We better hurry up with this. I'm very tired. I was sitting at that, there was an interview, a press conference of Joe Cocker the singer, and after, you know, I used to always like to get to know these blokes and most of the time I'd say, my mum loves you, she's such a big fan, is there any chance of getting having a photograph taken with her? She's gonna love this, she'll frame it. And, and of course there was no worries, so when we'd done all that, I sat down with another photographer, photographer called Richard Webb. We sat at the bar and ordered three schooners so they went down quick. So we, you know, having a chat with Joe, he was a normal sort of a bloke. He sat in the middle with two big chairs and the bar stools. More schooners, more schooners. There's other blokes coming in, patting him on the shoulder and his manager come over and someone else come over and say, you know, right, oh, Joe, and he's saying, no, it's okay. And we got on really nice anyway. Probably after about six or eight 
schooners or something like that, which was winning to taste really nice. And and um, remember, Joe puts his foot up just up on the bar like that a little bit, and he just wanted to lean back and stretch the legs. And he's had his beer in his hand, and he's all of a sudden he started to topple, but he managed to put the beer on the counter, and he, he fell back on this big high stool. And Webby's on one side, I'm on this side. Just before he's hit the ground, we've managed to grab the chair and we lifted him up. And as soon as he got to the top and he put the chair down and he balanced, he's picked up that schooner and threw it down his throat. What a scream. It was all over in a, you know, a few seconds, but it was very clever and that was pretty funny. Well, give, us, give us one more funny story. Yep. Oh, Zsa Zsa Gabor, maybe. <clears throat> maybe that's a bit boring. Or oh, ask and route and that sort of thing. Or maybe um, people wouldn't know Silver Black, would they? Um, who, uh, no one knows Zsa Zsa Gabor. Hang on, I'm just trying to think. Um, Mr. Gabor, all of them knew him. Yeah, well, all the men. <laughs> all the men knew her. Yeah, all the horsemen knew her. What about... Um, I suppose I'd be talking about Ronnie Corbett. Everyone knows him, I feel. Oh, Ronnie Corbett, I remember uh, another time with Ronnie Corbett. He used to come to Australia a bit, and the first time I met him, I was highly amused at his antics. And we had a bit of a yarn, and, and I asked him to, would he mind being in a photograph with me for my mother, which was OK. And then we end up going out in the tennis court and he was using one of those huge, big, giant rackets. And I was just using an ordinary one. Now, he's only a tiny little fella, you know, RIP. He passed away the other day. And we had a photograph taken. And he said that time, he said, hey, you come up with all these silly ideas all the time. He said, that other photograph you've done, that's really silly, but it's different. It's a good idea. So I think about two years later he turned up and I was sitting in the audience uh, with the media and he says, I think, oh, there's that bloke that asked me to do all these silly things down the back there. And on that day, I have, just as a joke, I had a, a T-shirt printed that says, Tommy Campion, president of the Ronnie Corbett fan club, which he thought it was a scream, so he got some photographs done. And I think that day... I got him sort of sitting in a bar on top of a bar with his legs crossed with all these little drinks around him. So, you know, you, you meet all these wonderful people and most of the time they'll do anything you like. But there was a time when Don McLean, the, the singer, I do remember, who wasn't very funny. In fact, he was very angry. And when I asked him to do a picture, he said it was ridiculous and he didn't want to do that. And then I said, well, why not? It's publicity. You must do this. I don't have to do anything. I said, well, I just want a photograph. All I want you to do is to take your shoes off. I mean, that's not funny, but this man was just a bloody odd... He was just a bloody oddball. That's all as far as I'm concerned. I know he had some wonderful songs, but I didn't want to know about him after that, but they used it on the front page, I think. So, um, can you think of um, some, of the, some of the major stuff-ups you made on a job? You know, things that went wrong, I get up to film or something or whatever. Oh, oh, I've got a good one, that. Just start with uh, be stuff Beatles. Up. Yeah, oh, there was a huge stuff-up. I, I, I won't say I caused it, but the situation was I was sent up to Hamilton Island to photograph the opening and there was... Um, uh, uh, Peter Allen was up there on the stage singing and doing all his little dancing and, and down below in the crowd was George, but one of the Beatles, George Harrison, who happened to have a unit on Hamilton Island, which was owned by Keith Williams at the time then. And my gig where was to photograph George and whatever happened, and of course you got everything else that happened, and each time I wanted to do a shot of George, I had problems because people kept on blocking them, blocking me. So I'd move across the room and someone would block me doing these photographs. So at that stage, I thought, what are these fools doing? Just want a photograph. It's all pretty easy. We had a darkroom assistant come up with us too. 
he bring the kit up, he had it all set up and he was waiting at the door for my photographs and I thought, I've got to get this picture, we've got, to, we've got deadlines here. So I went to a bloke called um, Russ Hins, who was a, a, a government minister, the minister for everything, and I said to, Ruff, who was, uh, to Russ, who was always gruff, I said, mate, I need this photograph of yourself, George Harrison and J.B. Oki Peterson and Keith Williams and this and that, and I'm having a bit of trouble. Can you organise it? He said, leave it to me. Next to me, everyone's together. I moved them in tight. I had the power then, see? They were in tight. I moved people back. George was okay, and they got in close together, and I shot the guts out of it, close-ups, and knocked off pictures of George by himself and tried to stir him up so you get personality. Finish that. Hand the film, a couple of rolls of film to the young bloke. He disappears. About two hours later, he comes back, and I'm looking around, and he's standing at the door, beckoning me over. And I said, "What's going on? How'd they go?" I said, "They should be in the paper by now." And he said, "Well, we got no photos." I said, "What do you mean no photos?" He said, "I processed the whole lot in water. The the, the chemicals were marked wrong, and that the bottle." was just water. I said, hey, you know, he said, there was nothing on the film. I said, you've got to be joking. So it was, a, it was a matter of trying to organise George again, but, you know, it's getting two or three o'clock in the morning. I have still got nothing, so I went to bed. But the next morning I got up at, and having breakfast and the bloke said, Tommy, where were you last night? I said, I went to bed, I was tired. He said, we couldn't find you. George Harrison at sunset was sitting on the beach singing songs, My Sweet Lord. He was singing and playing the guitar as the sun came up. And there was no Tommy Campion. It was devastating, I tell you. Oh. And another thing I remember, which is a stuff up for me actually, was I was sent to Hamilton Island again for what they call race week, which is a big week. It's you know, you get your accommodation, you have your nice meals and you meet some lovely people and you have all this boat racing, which I don't really like, but it's a job. And then you do your pictures for the, for the day and this, then you put them on the wire and send them back. Well, the night before I was going, there was thunder and lightning and it was windy and I was, I was petrified. I got a huge fear of planes. I'm just starting to come good now with the help of a Valium. But... I had a huge fear of flying, so I knew David Sproul, uh, a photographer, we worked, he was on holidays, and um, I asked the boss, could I get someone else to do it, because I was petrified, so seeing David was on holidays, I rang David up and he said, yeah, I'd love to go, because when he gets up, through the lightning and the storm, it's smooth sailing. So what happened, he stays up there, he does the job. The last day, I'm at home on the Gold Coast, just hanging, the last day on the Saturday he was leaving, the main office, the, the big main office, the foyer, beautiful thatched roof, the whole court fire and the whole thing burnt down right next to the dolphin pool. So all these chairs were thrown in the pool, there's dolphins leaping around, there's flames as high as a, as a, as a high rise and David Sproul, who's there, taking all these pictures. And I believe he won sort of an award for all this with this place going up there. And I thought, half my luck. I mean, that's a real stuff up for me, I can tell you now. But that's the way it is. We'll just keep rolling. Uh, Remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'll just um, sort, of, sort of a loose question this one. But sort of the most. Meaningful photos that you've, you've taken, a couple of the most meaningful ones that has meant to you. Um, there were, uh, the most meaningful images, photographs or jobs, I imagine, um, you know, there are a lot, but there is one that um, stick, sticks in my mind, actually, that I got emotional then with that, is that, there was this young girl that I had to photograph with her family who was um, had kidney problems and she didn't expect to be living too long. 
and she was a sweet little child. I ended up turning up there and, and listened to the story and and I, I remember fighting it's um it's still so it still hurts. I remember photographing her at a piano. She said, play it, mum said, play a tune for Tommy. And she sat at the piano in this lovely little lace dress and she sat there and there was a beautiful light coming through the window and there was silky curtains hanging down and I thought, oh dear, oh, that's beautiful, that picture there. I remember photographing that picture and I used it pretty big in the paper and I also remember that we become really, really good friends the family, I become close to him, and I sort of, I felt involved in it, and I tried to do things, but of course it was all impossible. And subsequently, the little child, this dear little child, sort of was a month or so later passed away from a kidney disease, and that is that has stuck in my mind for for the last 25, 30 years, and uh, you know, and that's yeah, that's very, very sad. Today, her life could have been saved, I imagine. Okay, and sort of while we're on that topic, um, there's, a, there's a famous um, Chicago, Suns, uh, Chicago Sun photographer called George H. White, and he, he was sacked a couple of years ago, and he made this great, couple of great comments. He made a whole lot of great comments about press photography, which I never really thought about. But he described um, himself as the eyes of the nation or an a visual storyteller. So how do you see photography now, looking back, that you, you know? Oh, okay. know that, what, how did you well, see what your role was in society? Oh, my role was in society was, it wasn't just a job. I was doing something very, very important. I was recording history, no matter. Uh, Bill Smith with his um, large cabbage or zucchini, or the Queen, I was just recording history. And that's probably the most exciting thing about it. And I'm still doing it to this day. But, you know, it's, it was a job. And really you're not, um, you are achieving a lot in your own eyes, but as far as in the public's eyes, it's, it's just a photo. And, you know, if the Queen was jumping over a hurdle, well, it's no big deal to them, but to yourself it is. And I think that um, just recording that moment in time, the history of Australia. And um, that's quite an achievement to be able to do that and have the chance to do that, to be able to walk in front of people, to be able to be go through police lines, be able to be up front to shoot something that important. And it was, it's a, just a matter of um, being there and recording history. And that's how I see it. Great. Excellent. Um, Does that did, make sense? Yeah, that's good. We'll just keep going. This is a fairly short question. Did, did you have a mentor that you looked up to when you, when you started learning photography? Through the papers? Or lots of them? Or? Well, I, I can't really remember anyone, actually. But, no, I can't. I don't think I ever had one. I... I think I was, I don't know, I, I admired everyone. I, I imagine, let's put it this way, any person I worked with, I admired, who was able to achieve and go out and take photographs, but I, I can't think of anyone that's really well known in this world today or back all those ages ago when I started that I had really admired. I sort of didn't know much myself, you know. I was a sort of a point-and-shoot type person and then they later on a camera company got a camera out called point-and-shoot and I suppose it was a matter of me just learning myself and without what you know think of anyone else I, I, I like their style or anything it was just Tommy just doing what he had to do all aboard Please.